When it came time for Walt Whitman, America's greatest poet, to write a poem evoking the boundless and abundant future of the United States, he started it by writing these words. By blue Ontario's shore. The poet was writing about the south shore of Lake Ontario, an area just a few miles from Niagara Falls in New York State. Whitman wrote, By blue Ontario's shore, while the winds fanned me and the waves came trooping toward me, I thrilled with the power's pulsations. Teddy Roosevelt, the reform governor of New York State, came to Blue Ontario's shore as well. He came to speak to the bedrock of Republican power, a huge gathering of farmers, laborers, and merchants, the good citizens, as he called them, of Niagara County, who lived in and near a small village situated beside Lake Ontario. The village was Alcott, and it served as a place for Sunday worship and Saturday shopping, for mild entertainment and political business. A quiet town, centrally located along the lake shore with a quiet creek running through it that formed a quiet harbor protected from the ravages of the lake. That harbor proved the making of Alcott. After the Civil War and consequent naval tensions along the Canadian border, the federal government established twin piers at the mouth of 18 Mile Creek and took responsibility to dredge the entrance of the harbor. Ten years later, an oil-powered lighthouse was added to the end of the West Pier. One hundred years ago, the southern shore of Lake Ontario teemed with agricultural abundance. In the fields above the Niagara Escarpment were planted wheat, barley, and corn. From rich bottomlands came onions and potatoes. And under the escarpment, in the plains that bordered Lake Ontario, orchards supplied the nation with apples and peaches. The farmers, families, and laborers that produced this abundance celebrated its goodness, their hoped-for prosperity, and their unexpected leisure by gathering in the summer at day-long picnics. Picnic Day was filled with visiting, oratory, games and contests, tables filled with food and grass trampled by dancing feet. A few people even built homemade rides. Year after year, the picnics went on. Such a regular feature of any summer soon found a permanent home. The largest summer picnic in Niagara County was held every year by the Pioneer Association in the Tenbrook Grove just outside Alcott. The association laid claim to the grove by erecting a log cabin on the property to serve as a reminder of pioneer life and as a living display for school children. The cabin was dedicated as Ye Old Log Cabin during the picnic August 8, 1888. That was just a few years after Governor Roosevelt himself came to the Tenbrook Grove to speak to over 10,000 picnickers. The only disappointment Governor Roosevelt, T.R., suffered during his visit to Alcott was the ride in a coach from Lockport North. Although there were railroad tracks, there was no passenger service north from Lockport. The tracks that ran from the harbor of the creek south to Lockport carried apples and peaches, corn and wheat, south to Buffalo, and from there to points all across the country. By 1900, the era of railroad expansion was over. The International Railway Company, the IRC, was the largest railroad that provided the Buffalo region with trolley service. For the directors of the IRC, the problem was simple. If their company was to continue to grow, new destinations had to be found so that the thousands of urban trolley riders within the city would want to take those same trolleys out into the healthy countryside. 
The IRC floated a much smaller company, the Lockport and Alcott Railway, using it to buy up the Tenbrook Grove and the land surrounding it. The IRC planned to turn the area into a major resort with a full-service entertainment complex by using the local company as a blind. The largest part of this complex was to be a modern hotel built right on Lake Ontario to be called the Alcott Beach Hotel. The plan worked. The Alcott Beach Hotel was completed in 1902 for a modest $89,470. It was the largest hotel north of the Erie Canal, and the hotel was one of the first to aspire to be a self-sufficient community. The hotel, it was, you know, 200 feet long and 70 feet wide, so when you think of it, the size of it, and you compare it to a football field, it was two-thirds the size of a football field. So, and uh, the, the floor plan showed, and the, the elevations, the outside elevations show on the front side of the hotel, it shows three floors, but on the back side, it shows five, because the bottom level had, uh, was, that was right on the lake level, they had changing rooms and stuff there. And then um, on the second level, there was a barber shop, a game room, and a beauty salon. And then the third level, there was a nice restaurant, uh, an eating establishment. And it was a, a totally enclosed or encircled in glass. And you could open the windows, and it was really quite a place. And then the fourth level was the um, big dance hall. The casino, or ballroom, was so large that on opening day, June 8, 1902, the Pittsburgh Symphony, led by Victor Herbert, serenaded thousands within the room and thousands more who heard the concert through the open windows. An eyewitness wrote, Notwithstanding the fact that the thermometer was but a few degrees above the freezing point, that a strong wind, almost a gale, blew in from the lake, and that winter garments were the only popular attire, 10,000 people packed the Grove, the casino, and other places of interest at Alcott Beach yesterday. About one-third heard the beautiful concert in the large and spacious casino. Designed to be the self-sufficient center of an elaborate entertainment complex that included an amusement park and an open-air theater, the Alcott Beach Hotel soon drew thousands of customers from Buffalo. From Lafayette Square at the heart of downtown Buffalo, passengers embarked every 30 minutes for an express trolley ride to Lockport, New York, northeast of Buffalo on the Erie Canal. The International Railway Company described the ride this way. Upon leaving the Buffalo City Line for the open country, the ride is most beautiful and follows the smooth, well-ballasted roadbed through the Tonawandas to the city of Lockport, where are located the wonderful locks in the Erie Canal, many industries, and beautiful homes. What homes passengers saw is not at all clear because once in Lockport, they switched to high-speed cars to carry them at up to 70 miles an hour toward a brand new station at the eastern edge of Alcott, designed to give them easy access to the hotel. The whole trip might last a breathless hour and a half. The official brochure describes the route from Lockport to Alcott as an Edenic pastoral. It read, leaving Lockport, the car once more in the open country speeds its way through peach and apple orchards, and the beautiful fruit section of Niagara County is viewed for miles around. Yet, packed with passengers as the cars often were, and running at such high speed even at night, accidents were a constant worry. Jim Mack was the motorman on the first car train, and he ran into a stall freight, wide open, doing 70 miles an hour. 
and my father was covered, he threw his uniform and everything away. They, they picked up the dead, the wounded, everybody, and took them highballed right straight to Lockport Hospital. And uh, he just threw his clothes away after that. They picked everybody up, whether they were dead or what. But there was 40 people killed outright. And uh, they had a, a flagman up the track with a lantern, and he threw it right through the window where the motorman was on the first train. And he was either asleep or dead. They don't know which. Naturally, he was killed. The Alcott Terminal was designed to introduce the passenger to the wonders of the IRC's complete resort and to gently but firmly usher passengers to the IRC attractions and to point them to the magnificent Alcott Beach Hotel at the other end of the park. Passengers stepped from the terminal into a park. They could hear the band organ playing from the large Herschel Carousel, called by IRC publicists an electric riding gallery. Or, on most days of the week, a regimental band might be in the park as well. Originally, that wasn't the era of the big name bands when it was first built. They had the regiment bands from Buffalo, the 65th and the 74th regiment band come out from Buffalo. And they came out by trolley. And to advertise what was going to go on, they played their instruments as they passed through every little village or hamlet to tell everybody there's a dance tonight. Dancing basically was on a Wednesday and a Saturday night. That was when the regiment bands came out. And a woman told me they used, when they got to the trolley station in the east end of the park, they would take out their instruments and porters would take their bags to the hotel and they would start playing as they marched through the park one end to the other, and the kids would mark up, fall in behind them and pretend they were in a parade marching to the Alcott Beach Hotel. For passengers staying at the Alcott Hotel, there was no worry about baggage, just a pleasant stroll through the park under the tall shade trees, unencumbered, while you planned your visit or greeted old acquaintances. If a passenger didn't want to walk, the IRC had a miniature railroad on hand that ran back and forth between the trolley depot at one end of the park and the Alcott Beach Hotel at the other. The first thing that we would remember as children, because we had a chance to get on these little cars, the people were getting off the streetcar, they could get on this miniature railway and it looped around and it would take them down along and then it turned up into the park and the people could get off to go into the big hotel. It was not only fun for kids to get on, I'm sure that many people used it to get from the uh, streetcar to the big hotel. My father had the job of operating this little steam engine. Of course, I spent most of my time down there that summer. There was always room for me to ride somewhere on the little train, and probably that has stayed with me more than anything else that I remember from that time. The opening of a luxury hotel in Alcott soon brought customers from across Lake Ontario. Toronto lay just 27 miles across the water and an international border. Soon steamers were carrying passengers back and forth several times a day, landing at the Federal Pier opposite the lighthouse. A series of steamers became a familiar, beloved presence as one by one they approached the pier in the summer days at Alcott Beach. The columns of smoke from the coal-burning boilers could be seen on clear days halfway across the lake, and their great horns could be heard almost as far. Most of the day, a steamer could be seen coming or going from the federal piers. Children liked to impress their parents and each other by being the first to identify the approaching ship 
as the Argyle, or the Alcott, or the Chicora. One particular picnic they had down here, um, the people came from Toronto and they had such a good time, they all decided to wait for the last boat to go back home. And the boat couldn't hold them all. So they, the boat started pulling out, going back to Toronto, and the people got kind of nasty about it and started throwing things at the boat. And then they, they took their, their frustrations into the park, and then later nobody knew that they were going to make an unprecedented trip back to Aka to pick up all these people that couldn't get on the boat. But by the time the boat got back here, everyone found a place to stay. Uh, people put them up or they stayed at the hotel or something and stayed for the night and didn't go back to Canada until the next day. A lot of times, the people who came from Toronto, for example, the first thing they wanted to do was get off the boat and run up to a place called Bradley's Restaurant, where Mrs. Bradley was a fabulous cook. And she personally saw to it that everything served was up to par and was just great to eat. I know a man I know named Roy Phipps, and his wife-to-be was a waitress there, and she told him and he told me that when they heard the boat whistles blow, all the waitresses, everybody had to run to their stations because they knew they'd be swamped in just a matter of minutes. Just as soon as the people could get from the east pier up to the restaurant, they'd be swamped with customers. Bradley's restaurant wasn't the only business to smarten up at the arrival of the Toronto steamers. As passengers walked up from the lake to the center of Alcott, an almost bewildering number of choices confronted them. Around the time the IRC built its entertainment complex, and even predating it, were a number of friendly, less luxurious hotels like the Castle Inn. Its old-fashioned wraparound porches faced the Civil War monument right at the center of town. By standing under that statue, a vacationer could look in any direction and see numerous establishments, all catering to his or her needs. Down the block was Luna Park. Next door was a dance hall called Dreamland. Named it is said after Jerome Kern's early Tin Pan Alley hit, Meet Me Tonight in Dreamland. Dreamland stayed open longer, all night in fact, and its prices undercut the upscale casino in the hotel. Further west was 18 Mile Creek and Alcott Harbor, safe anchor for everything from large steam yachts to sailboats of every description to simple rowboats and canoes. To the east were more restaurants, plain and fancy, an ice cream parlor, a penny arcade, and yet another dance hall, Ulrich's. Along Main Street were most of the photography studios. The teeming summer life at Alcott was documented by a handful of photographers whose studios on Main Street produced hundreds of images for postcards, portraits, and souvenirs. Well, the photographers that frequented this area at the turn of the century, um, and they kind of left a legacy of all these great pictures that we have. There was uh, Tinny Gilbert. He was actually, his name was Elmer Gilbert, and he was the first one to set up and do a lot of the pictures and he did tintypes and that's how he got his name. And then later on, uh, followed by the name of Bachman set up and he actually uh, was located in the park and he was famous for all the backdrops he did. Um, everybody around has backdrops of their grandparents sitting in a boat that says Alcott Beach on it and um, he did one with a uh, backdrop of the hotel. He did one with a big air balloon, a hot air balloon. Um, he did one with a dog pulling a cart. He was real famous for the backdrop drops and uh, people come to him all the time for pictures. And then there was Bert LaValle. Now Bert LaValle was located on Main Street and he's famous for those panoramic, long panoramic prints. He did a series of eight of those and as far as we know, he we, we've only been able to locate eight of them. Uh, we have, uh, he also did regular postcards but these panoramic prints he was famous for, and most of your postcard collectors um, collect these, and they're, they're uh, very famous and very popular to get. I think it was F.H. Leslie, and he was from Niagara Falls, and he did calendars and postcards, and a lot of his postcards are in this area. I mean, and a lot of them are the, his signature was the black and white picture with the blue sky. 
because uh, most of your photographs taken back then, if they had color to them, the colorization process was done in Germany or from German. They had the technology back then to do that. So most of them postcards that were taken weren't colorized. They were uh, just black and white. But Leslie added the colored sky to it. And uh, that was kind of his signature. When you see a, a, a postcard like that, you can be sure that Leslie did it. I remember him because after all, that was pretty important that we were going to have our picture on a postcard, no less. And to think that I, I know, we must have had our pictures taken at a different time because the one picture I have, my mother is with us. And then the other picture, it is just my sisters and myself. But to think that somewhere along the way in my family, they didn't throw them all away and that I have them. And, and they probably mean as much to me as Olcott, and, and that's my memory. These photographs and postcards seem to lock the era forever in a quiet repose, a serious, contemplative beauty that makes the handwritten sentiments seem ageless as well. Epitaphs for the quiet life. Dear Florence, I am having a wonderful time. Bathing is fine, and I am eating so much you won't know me. Right soon, thanks for the money, Bill. Dear friend, this is where we go rowing every morning. I'm having a fine time and not a bit homesick. This is a lovely place. There are a great many people here. They have a lovely bathing beach here. How is your mother? If I have time, I'll write, but oh dear, I go so much. Emma. Dear Mary, this is to remind you of this beautiful hotel at the beach. We are enjoying ourselves hugely. My brother was here from Sunday to Wednesday. We start Sunday morning on a 600-mile water trip to Quebec. Return to Charlotte Beach Saturday, September 8th, and hope to be at Lebanon Sunday a.m., September 9th. Our love to all from Frank F. Blessing. Important to the success of the Alcott Beach Hotel and central to the plans of the IRC was the building of an amusement park. Built opposite the old picnic grove, adjacent to the hotel grounds, the Rialto drew thousands of customers through its gates every summer. The rides may seem unsophisticated today, but each was several steps ahead of the old handmade rides of the pioneer picnic days. The Rialto was the highlight, too, for us, because that was where we went to ride on the merry-go-round and the roller coaster. You know, that's a real thrill. The stage of the open-air theater was backed by the lake itself. Drama, vaudeville, and music could be heard most afternoons and evenings. The Alcott Beach Hotel was named for its beach. Swimming, or as it was called in polite society, bathing, remained for a generation the most popular of all the activities Alcott Beach offered its visitors. Besides the hotel's beach that stretched across the width of the hotel and featured a bathing pier, there was a public bathing house and beach located near the steamboat piers. There, at the water's edge, was built a large wooden slide. Its high profile dominated many snapshots taken by enthusiastic bathers. Most memories of Alcott inevitably lead to romance. A courtly, time-consuming ballet of encounters, introductions, outings, and escorts. Nothing so brash as a date. A favorite place for a romantic assignation was on the quiet creek. Relatively alone at last, in a rented boat or a canoe, the couple would enjoy the scenery and talk without being overheard. For the adventurous, the lake provided the thrill of sailing. Almost every summer night, from the era of gas lights to the introduction of neon, couples danced in the bright glow of evening inside the hotel's giant ballroom. Well, we'd dance there. They'd start at 8 o'clock and dance till 2. 
in the, and at times they'd have a band on each end, like they did at Crystal Beach. So there was, all you had to do was hand in a ticket and keep right on dancing. <laughs> and I had some friends that were ticket takers, and instead of giving them one, they give me a hand. <laughs> My sisters were going to this dance, and no way was I supposed to go, but they didn't get any peace until they let me go along with them. And I think I probably danced one dance with somebody that knew me or something, but I really didn't belong there. But you know, you don't forget something like that. That was a beautiful ballroom. And then of course, uh, the different fox rats, the bands all try different speeds, you know. And then when it come night uh, closing time, you knew when that was coming, what they played. What, what did they play? Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> As dance style gave way to dance style, different songs were sung. Different couples danced. Different bands filled the air with music. Before the demolition of the hotel in 1938, its bandstand boasted a fabulous array of entertainers, from the Pittsburgh Symphony to Tommy Dorsey and his band. The hotel closed at the zenith of the swing era, when dance was king. And with the disappearance of the hotel and the world war that followed, the crowds ebbed and eventually disappeared as well. That was all Cop Beach. The last dance had ended. The last notes of the music have faded. What remains of Alcott Beach? The hotel was raised in 1938. Its foundation pillars were sinking into the clay beneath the beach. The boathouse on the creek is no more, but the quiet creek still is home to all kinds of boats. The Pioneer Association has disbanded, and there are no longer civic picnics in the grove where it built ye old log cabin but families still picnic beneath the leaves of the old grove. Steamboats no longer blast their horns as they approach the piers, but people still fish from the old platform. No young couples watch from their hotel room the waves lap the beach. The completion of the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1960 raised the level of Lake Ontario enough to bury the wide beaches themselves, but swimmers still swim from the strand that remains. Although thousands no longer come every summer weekend to the village by Blue Ontario's shores, a few people still thrill to the power's pulsations while the winds fan them and the waves race toward them. And they enjoy themselves by Blue Ontario's shores.